Welcome to Twice Five Miles Radio, fertile ground for conversations worth listening to and remembering. I'm your host, James Nave, always airing first on WPVMLP, Asheville 103.7, and streaming online, WPVMFM.org, the voice of Asheville, heard all over the world and on other community radio stations like KCEI, Cultural Energy Radio, out of Taos, New Mexico. Thank you, Walter Parks, for our theme song, WalterParks.com. Thank you, Devine. Dial for managing WPVM FM. We really do appreciate it. And if you would like to reach out to me, Nave at jamesnave.com. Also, like to remind you, this show's sponsored by the Imaginative Storm Project. If you'd like to improve your writing, the website is imaginativestorm.com. And there you will find some helpful tips that will move you across the page in an easier way. Today, my guest is Waylon Green. Waylon is a documentary filmmaker, along with uh, TV productions and writing as well, with many credits, including The Hellstorm Chronicle, which he won an Oscar for in 1972. The Hellstorm Chronicle is a documentary about the relationship or the battle between insects and human beings. And the most notable part about Hellstorm Chronicle it's set up like a horror show, a battle, if you will. It's very dramatic. And most especially what makes it quite dramatic is how close the shots are of the insects. It's almost like you're sitting on the back of a cockroach or an ant or a fly. Very, very close. And the music is great. And the conflict between humans and insects is really terrific. So. I'd like for you to just sit back and get ready to enjoy some of the things that Waylon has to say about our environment today and his relationship with it. And we begin with Waylon telling us a bit about what got him started in the first place, why he enjoyed nature as a young person, and why he still enjoys it even today. So here we go, Waylon Green. Well, I don't really know, you know, exactly when it started. Uh, I, I've always been interested as a kid, uh, you know, I'm talking about grammar school and maybe even kindergarten. I was one of those kids that was interested in birds and lizards and snakes and just animal life and gravitated towards that. I had a dinosaur obsession, as most young males do. It, it went on to a point like when I was 10 or 11 years old, actually, I, I think it started with a comic book called The Black Hawk, which was about a guy, he was some kind of a Second World War hero, it was fictional, and he flew this black plane, this black fighter plane, and he had a black hawk. And so I became enamored of the idea of actually having a hawk. And I went to a pet store when I was, uh, I think, t nine or 10 years old. And there was a kestrel, which is a small falcon. And it had been shot with a BB gun. It had one eye. And my mother bought it for me. And I named it Hawkeye. For that began, I, I, you know, he was just my pet hawk, really. And But then uh, someone told me about an article in the 1920s National Geographic on falconry. And in those days, you know, you get back, people actually got back issues. And I looked it up and I read the article and I thought, oh, Hawkeye is potentially a falcon, you know, that could be trained for falconry. And that began an obsession with uh, falconry. Uh, and although career wise, I had to give it up for long stretches, I really, and also the peregrine became endangered. So nobody wanted to take endangered birds out of the wild and the breeding effort began and everything. And so that took me out of it until I was, say, 22, until I was 52. And then when I was 52, I got a falconer's license and rejoined the sport. And today I'm retired. Uh, you know, I'm 85 and I live in the San Inez Valley, which is an area to, where falconry is possible. I have two falcons and... Uh, some falconer friends, and, uh, you know, we still engage in it. What happened to Hawkeye, the pair of the little, little um, uh, kestrel? The little kestrel I had for about a year and a half. I used to ride around with him on uh, the handlebars of my bicycle. 
In fact, uh, my wife's mother, I've known my wife since then, when I was 11 and I met my, my wife's family, uh, she said the first image I ever had of you was a boy on a bicycle with a hawk on the handlebars. Uh, the neighbor's cat got Hawkeye when I was about 12. Oh, no, I bet that was a disastrous feeling, wasn't it? That was bad. That was bad. Mm -hmm. I know that for those people out there listening, if you have not identified hawks, you probably maybe have seen a little kestrel sitting on the telephone wires in your area. And the way you can tell a kestrel is it, I think it bobs its tail when it sits. Is that correct? That is correct. Actually, there's another small falcon called a merlin that's about the same size, which is more less common than a kestrel. And when you see a, a small falcon land, if it doesn't bob its tail, it's a merlin. And if it bobs its tail, it's a kestrel. So there you go. People out there listening can start out their bird watching career by looking for a little small falcon that's bobbing its tail. And they'll say, that's a kestrel. I can t hear in your voice. There's a little remorse even now. That's true. I mean, that's true of any animal that you have. If you lose them, it's uh, it's rough. And if you're going to be interested in animals, it's going to happen. And um, most of my life, I've I've been in, well. I started in natural natural history films. You know, I got a break because I knew something about it. And the National Geographic uh, had four hour long documentaries a year in those days on CBS. I was kind of a good fit, and I ended up making, you know, a number of films for them that involved natural history. Well, you know, when I was getting ready to have this conversation with you, usually, as I told you before we started, I, I prepare a little bit when I don't know somebody, but I like to keep it open-ended so we can have conversations about kestrels on bicycles. You still have your movie, The Hellstorm chronicles on youtube and i watched it and it's all about insects and how insects may well win the species war or the species competition between humans and the rest of the animals and then the insects so you made that film i think you won an academy award for it is that correct yes that, that is correct how did hawkeye and all of that bring you to that film? And was that the first one of a series or did you build up to that? Well, I told, as I told you before, because I was uh, avidly interested in natural history from my childhood on, uh, when I got into filmmaking and the National Geographic had these specials and they were an hour long special on different subjects. And I did one on the Amazon. I did one on birds. I did one on reptiles and amphibians. And I did one on insects. And the one that I did on insects, I didn't know much about insects, but it, as part of the wonderful thing about a job like that, and I would have paid them, by the way, to you know do what I was doing. You have to research something very thoroughly. And when I was researching the insects, I met an entomologist actually in Brazil, a German, Becker, Harold Becker said, What's, what, what about insects makes them more compelling than anything else? And he said, well, as a life form, they're the most successful life form on the planet of anything above bacterial level. And one could actually consider them the inheritors of the planet if we destroy it. And uh, I thought, oh, that's kind of an interesting idea. Because insects have an amazing ability to adaptation. You throw some kind of a curve at them, and they will adapt their way around it. Turn the uh, north of England uh, black with coal soot, and a species of moth that's white with, over a period of 10 or 15 years will become black so it can hide itself in so on soot-stained trees. I thought, hmm, maybe adaptation is actually, as a survival advantage, is superior to intellect. I like the idea of knocking humanity down from its chosen place of eminence. So I thought that's kind of an interesting idea. I wonder if I could illustrate that on film. So that, that's how Hellstrom Chronicle was born. When I watched the movie, which was made, as you said, I think in night, the early 70s, late 60s. I think I finished it in 1971. 
so the the movie does have the style of of the 1970s the fellow who's playing the role of the narrator looks like he was in the 70s all of the computer gear looks like it's in the 70s that said the rest felt like it was filmed tomorrow because all of those insects are timeless interestingly enough one of the people that i spoke to said i can't remember where it was it, it was at some think tank or somewhere and he said you know the big point that you're missing is climate what we're doing is we're destroying the climate with co2 emission and yes the insects will thrive in a warmer earth when humans die out and i thought that's a little too far out there you know so I didn't include it in the film, but I think if I'd have included it in the film, yes, it, it would have made it more contemporary. I wonder, of course, it was 1970 when this was out. And if somebody wants to view it, the Hellstorm Chronicles on YouTube, and you can see the whole movie. I didn't get the sense that you had left climate change out when I watched that film and I watched it the last couple of days. So I finished it this morning while I was having my coffee. So I'm current with the driver ants and how they attacked everything. I got the sense that the whole thing was about climate change and that you didn't really have to say it. It was really about alteration of the earth to a degree that it becomes inhabitable. Stylistically, the film is a horror movie. And I, so I, I wanted to hide an environmental message film in a horror movie. That was my goal. I look at it now, actually, usually when you look at any film, you've either directed or written or whatever, you only see the things you should have done and felt you didn't do, you know. That's just the flaw of having done something. But I did feel that people were trashing the earth and, and in a variety of ways. The specifics of climate change, I could have mentioned because they were known and discussed. They weren't as preeminent as, say, pesticide or water pollution or petrochemical pollution at that time had more to do with oil and water than it did CO2 in the air. It's in there. It's not the top layer on the cake. And when you were making that film, you were much younger, starting your career in the film business, the TV business. Did you have a sense then what it might look like now in 2022? Could you imagine forward to where we are now, which is not very pretty? It looks pretty rough out there in a lot of places. I couldn't imagine it like it is, and it is actually maybe even worse than I imagined it was going to be, uh, very possibly. And, and I think everyone who is interested in natural history felt the presence of these dangers, of radioactivity. At that time, pesticide was a big deal. The peregrine falcon was down to 150 breeding pairs east of the Mississippi. And it was the effort of biologists and falconers, really, that bred them and re-released them and brought them back. So I was very aware of that. And I thought that all these things that were endangered, you know, they were the miners' canaries of, of the world that we were living in. And as they went, you know, we would someday go. And I wanted to scare people with that. One of the points that I picked up, and I knew this already, the insect world has done very well. It has survived. It thrives, as you pointed out in that movie, and it's still true today. Uh, only a tiny few years later compared to the millions of years the insects have lived. But those species are species designed to survive, and that's exactly what they do. We also appear to be relatively successful at the moment because we have 8 billion plus people. I don't know what the population of the earth is right now. And yet we seem bent on self-destruction. Are we in our self-destructive ways creating an environment that will allow us to survive? Or are we the only species on Earth bent on wiping ourselves out? I think we are a species, if not bent on wiping ourselves out, in fact, wiping ourselves out. So, uh, and this came back to the original idea that intrigued me back then, way back then. I haven't thought about this for a long time, but intellectually, we're in control of everything. Intellectually, we can alter the earth 
if you want to take it beyond where it is now, there's a thing called planeturgy, where you could envelop the Earth in a mylar sphere and control climate, go and on and on. The, the question is, it, it comes down to the quality of living on the earth. I mean, do we want to just survive? Because I suppose technologically we could survive even if there could be some point at which our intellect was trans was put into machines that ran on nuclear fusion or something like that and could last indefinitely, but we would not exist as a living thing, we would exist as a machine projected our lives. We would not know whether we were alive or dead. We would be in there. I mean, those are all thoughts that are probably possible within human intellectual achievement, but it, maybe that's maybe that's another horror story to me. You know, I like being alive. I like feeling the warmth or heat or unpleasantness or the cold or the wind or the rain or, you know, I, I like feeling the things that are real around me. And uh, I hope that doesn't vanish as a part of, of life just for the sake of having life or calling ourselves alive. I don't think it has to. I do think, as you pointed out in the movie and as we've all seen, human beings do have the ability to intellectually assess something, analyze it, and and respond to it in a way that will benefit them and the community they live in, or destroy it. And we can go in the direction of, of benefit if we want to, although we don't seem to be inclined to do that. Or maybe I'm affected by all of the news around me, perhaps we are more inclined toward well-being and optimism than we think. I don't know. I don't know if optimism is the right word, I, I, because I think we're inclined towards convenience. It's true that you can address a problem, but you, if you're addressing it for future generations and not your own, it's inconvenient. And I can't really think of any time really in history when people have thought that way. I mean, they've thought about what works today. Empires of conquest didn't think about, oh, we're doing this for our legacy. They thought, let's grab up Persia because we're going to be richer today than we were yesterday. I don't think humans can project the future. People sit down, they think of utopian or dystopian or whatever it is. But I don't think the reality of what needs to be to done today to make a better tomorrow has ever been an effective measure of, of human achievement. It doesn't seem to be. And yet I keep holding out hope that somehow collectively we will figure that out, but we don't seem to reach that point right now. Well, right now it seems it has to somehow be connected to what brings current reward. Panama Canal is an amazing project technologically and on so many levels when you think of the time it was done and the fact that there was no energy source in Panama. So how would they operate the canal? And the engineers said, well, wait a minute, there's 190 to 200 and something inches of rain every year. There is the energy source. All we do is wait for it to rain and use the water to produce hydroelectric and we have everything we need to run this canal from now on. So that is an example of, of human genius thinking beyond the immediacy of just getting ships from one ocean to another. It could be done. The nature of politics and human rule and so forth are, are not in favor of it. And you went on from the Hellstorm Chronicles to having a career in, broadly speaking, the communication business, which included movies and television and, and all of the rest. And you've been involved in many projects. Some of the projects people would know if you mentioned them. In all of that work, getting all of this material out in front of the public, did you try to influence the way these presentations were made to get messages in these popular shows that expressed what you were thinking around 
the environment and the future of humanity. I didn't necessarily set out to write something as a, I usually set out from the story standpoint. Usually it was a story I liked or a setting that I liked or an era that I liked or something like that. But I have noticed, just looking back at stuff, that I tend to trend towards some kind of dystopian outcome and that I seem to favor an apocalyptic view. You know, I've thought about this and I thought, no, I didn't really set out to that. I think because if you had talked to me at the time, I would have just said, no, you know, that's just the way things are. What do you mean? You know, so uh, but my tendency I think is to almost, uh, in many cases, just rewrite the message of the Hellstrom Chronicle a number of times without ever having admitted to it. This is the first time I have ever copped to that. But it, but I guess I'm not really copying to it because when I did it, I have to tell you quite honestly, I was not aware of it. Well, you know, when you do creative work, part of the joy of the mess, trying to figure out what you're going to do next, is letting something bubble up from inside of you and surprise you. And perhaps you say, not realizing you've done it at the time, you look back on it, you think, my God, the Hellstorm Chronicles followed me throughout my entire work, or a bit of it was there. Yeah, it has. When I was very enamored of Brecht in my 20s, and there's a very hard edge to Brecht's view of the world. And I'm not just talking about the plays, you know, even the poems and the short stories, you know, the same thing. Um, and I liked that. I gravitated towards that. I gravitated towards writers that were, you know, had a very dark view of life. But I like comedy. I like to laugh. I, I'm very admiring of, of anything that makes people laugh. I've written quirky stuff that was funny. It's always sort of in the context of something a little darker. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is the haunting presence of the Hellstrom Chronicle. Well, once you dive into the artistic elements, they seem to blossom inside of you. You being you, me, any of us listening. Remind us, what were some of the shows that you worked on where you had this more you know, dystopian view of things? Actually, going back before Hellstrom Chronicle, when I was doing the geographic shows, you know, my, whenever I did a show, I always look, what is the theme of this? Thematically, what do we want to say here? The Amazon show was that people have set out to conquer the Amazon. The Amazon has always in turn conquered them. Ford made a city, you know, in the Amazon, Fordlandia, to have rubber for his cars if it's overgrown with vines and it's in ruins. People have gone in there since looking for El Dorado and failed miserably and it's turned back home. So that was the theme of the Amazon show. Then when I did reptiles and amphibians, I looked at reptiles and amphibians and I thought, hmm, what's interesting about them is they're way down in rank. You know, they're, we look at them and they're either underfoot or there's something that we find even possibly repulsive, but they were once rulers of this place. If you'd come as an alien to the earth, you know, 70 million years ago and said, what's there to report home that you'd say, oh my God, the place is ruled by these giant reptiles. They're incredible. I mean, they're huge and they're, they do this and they do that. That would have been the most impressive life form you would have encountered. And now they're just survivors. So the theme of that show was here are the reptiles and their survivors to remind us that they had a great age and it's now gone. Kind of like, uh, the Keats poem, Guy Laying in the Sand, I can't remember the name of it. I guess I look for that even in films. The bad guys couldn't necessarily be determined to be bad guys because often the good guys were just as bad in a different way. And so the whole thing was fomented corruption that would just define what the world was. I've always tended to go there. I, I don't tend to go there as a person, I don't think. When I'm been in charge of a film set or so I like a happy ship. So what would be an example of a character in one of your films that that was the bad guy? Well, I wrote a film called The Wild Bunch and the film was highly criticized at the time because the Wild Bunch were bad guys, but they had one ennobling feature. They were intensely loyal to each other and they were loyal to the standards of loyalty. 
And so uh, for all of things that they did, that was the theme of the film, that the, the, a person, the these people can be bad in many ways, but they, there's one thing about them that is possibly ennobling, you know? And that in the case of these people was loyalty. And when I wrote it, I was hanging around these cowboys who were also thieves. They were stealing mainly air conditioning units from new apartment buildings in the San Fernando Valley. And some of them were real, like heavier than that. And, and, and one of these guys actually robbed an unemployment office in Burbank because in those days, unemployment was like cash in a little envelope. You know, it wasn't a check. So they had cash. And he shot somebody, killed him, killed one of the uh, guards there. These two guys that I knew were going to trial. They were going to perjure themselves in this trial for him. And I argued with this guy. I said, Crawford, you know, you don't even like him. You hate him. You know, he's used, you know, he's a bad guy. And she said, I don't care. He's one of us. And he did. He went there and perjured himself. The, the thing fell apart. The guy was convicted as he should have been. And, you know, justice was served. But I thought that's interesting because it's so strong. You know, it overcame his intense hatred of the person, everything else, his feeling of obligation to loyalty, because they had come down from Sonora, California to go. They hitched a ride in the back of a truck. You know, they worked at the stockyards in L.A. Therefore, he had to do everything he could to save this guy. So I thought that was kind of an interesting idea dramatically, and I incorporated it into the film. And your other work on TV series, you also have done that same thing, haven't you, where you incorporate the loyalty into the characters? Because I, I watch a fair amount of series, like right now I'm currently watching Better Call Saul, yeah. which is a terrific show and in fact i would like to mention i'm in the last part of it and there's one scene where saul the lawyer drops a, an ice cream cone on the sidewalk on a pristine sidewalk in downtown albuquerque everybody is doing fine all the cars are clean all the suits are pressed and everybody's going about their daily business nobody sees the ice cream cone it hits the sidewalk he drives away in some car to do some deal somewhere down the line. And for the next three minutes, maybe, the ants discover this ice cream cone. And they consume the ice cream cone. And when I was watching that scene, thinking about all of these ants consuming the ice cream cone, nobody noticing the ants, I thought, I wonder if that's a reference to your film. Because the angles, the, the way they film the faces of the ants, the chomping of the ice cream, the ant climbing up the cone to get to the top, representing the, the hills of the termites in your movie. I thought, I wonder if they're referencing your, your film. So I don't know if you know that or not, but I thought, my gosh, there's influence still here even to this day. So in Better Call Saul, bad guys are bad. Saul is really bad. And yeah. yet he's not. He's yeah. good. If I run into Vince Gilligan, I'll ask him that. Actually, I'm watching it, too. And I have to say Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul is you know, TV doesn't get any better than that. I mean, they're both, you know, it's a terrific run. And, and it was the moral conflict was exactly the kind of thing that we're talking about, you know, where these people, you know, even a school teacher decides to become a meth or maker dealer. The theme of the idea of can life turn a good man bad, which is really where Vince Gillian took those shows, is a wonderful theme. And I thought he pulled it off, you know, because in the end, the chemistry teacher says to his wife, you'll go to the door someday. There'll be a horrible person there, person you're terrified of, and it'll be me. And... I do believe, I mean, we're, we're talking about a different idea now, but I, I, I do believe that life can impact a good person and make them bad. I mean, and the interesting theme is, could it go the other way? Usually bad people are psych, if they were truly bad, they're narcissistic or they're psychopaths and they don't have the ability to feel empathy or the difference between good and bad. And so they're just bad and it doesn't bother them. 
But I'm sure there are bad people who are bothered by it, and I suppose those people are candidates for redemption. It's interesting because you've worked with many actors in character development in the series that you've done over the years. And a character can go from good to bad like Mr. White did in Breaking mm -hmm. Bad. But then when I look back on it, I wonder, was he all that good to start with? And I wonder if any of us are all that good to start. We'd like to think we're all that good, but maybe, maybe we're not. And then if you go from good to bad, do people turn around and return back to good? How many people have gone from bad to good? I'd love to see a TV show that explored that flow back and forth between those two states of being. I don't know how that would work. Again, to give credit to Vince Gilligan, I think he more than anyone has explored that area. Now, I think the just the the facts of the story uh, of Breaking Bad, the impact of first of all it was only he was going to do it over three years, and then it was big show, and they wanted five, so I think it did run over five. The slings and arrows were too much to return that person anywhere. I think. I, I, there was no way. Now, Better Call Saul is a mellower show. It's a wonderful show. And Saul is an interesting character because Saul in many ways starts out sleazy. He has waves. You don't know where he's going to end up, you know? Uh, I always thought he was fundamentally a, a guy with some decency. He had a lot of bad shakes. He had the terrible brother. And, you know, we don't, you know, I mean, the stuff we do know about him is probably a lot of stuff we don't know. Don't tell me the end because I haven't seen the end of the series. Yet. Well, I, I, I haven't about. either. I haven't either. I mean, it, so, it it develops very well. It's just that one scene with the ice cream. And I was like, my God, the answer there. And that looks yeah. like a reference to your film. So who knows? Maybe, maybe it was. In storytelling, which is what your business is all about, you have done it all your life. You know how to write these stories. You know how to make a story happen because you've done it and you've seen it play out on the screens many times. For someone listening to this show thinking, well, I, I would like to try some storytelling myself. I would like to try to write some stories. Do you have any thoughts on how to encourage people to go in that direction without getting overwhelmed thinking I have to make the great opus? I have a lot of thoughts on it. I mean, I, you know, I do mentor people and have and enjoy it, by the way. And, and in fact, probably the thing I liked best about being a showrunner in television wasn't the fact that I got to write a bunch of some shows that I liked myself, but that I worked with other writers, some of whom it was their first project, the first thing they'd ever written. And I found that very rewarding. I would have to come at it almost from my own experience at the time that I first started doing it, it hadn't been broken down academically the way it is now. So I didn't know that movies had three acts. And actually, Sid Field and I, Sid who wrote the book that first described the three-act structure, we worked together at Wolper. And we, our job there was looking at old films to take clips out of them and make documentaries out of them. So we looked at you know, literally hundreds of films on high speed viewers. And we started seeing patterns, like we saw patterns in a Warner Brothers patterns were different than the MGM patterns. And Sid put it into a textbook and taught it. And I absorbed it, but not as sort of academically as he did. I just thought every story, if it's going to be told at one time, like a movie, you're going to go into a movie, you're going to sit down. And by the time you leave, that's you've heard the story. That's the story. And so it breaks down to it's going to have a beginning in which the story is set up. It's going to have a middle in which there's interaction that somehow continues your interest in the story and makes it even greater, you know, and then it's going to have an end that either resolves to your satisfaction or sometimes to your dissatisfaction the end of the story, but comes back to some, if it's good, even if I say it's dissatisfying, it was the right ending for that story. The story itself dictates, dictates that. It's basically what a raconteur does. If you're going to tell a story at a dinner table, it's very much like writing the story. If it's going to be well told in a good story, you might start it as a flashback. You might start with 
I saw this person who I actually thought had died. And I began asking about him, and this is what happened. And then you go, you know, you might do anything. You might use all of the devices in the oral telling of the story. And I was fortunate in life. My father was a pretty good raconteur, and so was my mother. So I heard that as a kid. I mean, I heard good storytelling at the dinner table. And then I also, I think I actually sought out people who could do that. And I liked listening. I always liked finding somebody that can tell a story and listening to them and encouraging them to tell another one. I think my basic story sense comes from that. Who do you want to read this story? How do you want this story to be found? Or how do you want others to see it? If it's a movie, you want to tell it in one sitting. It might be a little plot heavy because you need the plot to drive that in story-driven television. The plot is really very secondary and even tertiary. It's character. And so you think what elements in what I'm telling actually bring interest in this character or characters, whoever they are, to create an emotional dynamic. And then the emotional dynamic will actually usually in, in good TV, that'll be the action of the story. That'll be the melodrama of the story. People say, what do I, I'd like to write? And I, I mean, my first thing is, I don't know. I've never written a novel. I suppose I've written short stories because basically the treatment for a film or TV series is a short story. So I guess I have written those. I say, well, what, what, do, you, what do you want to do with this? Where do you want to go with it? Who do you want to read it? And how do you want it read? If, if that's the case, then these are the ways to think about it. And when you were writing for TV, did you write on demand? Did somebody come and say, hey, Waylon, I have a great idea for a, a show, and I'd like for you to create the, the story for it? Or did you come up with the ideas yourself and pitch them to your community? Well, both, really. If you're coming up with an original show, then you go and you say, this is my idea for a show. And you pitch that idea. If you're hired to work on a show, you come into the show. This is how I first saw it, but I actually have mellowed a bit in my view. I originally saw it as you're going to write chapters in someone else's book. Dickens has written the first three chapters uh, or four or whatever. And you're going to come in now and pick up his characters, kinds of events that he has them involved in and so forth. And you're going to run with it and go as far as you can and see if you can stay true to those characters and true to his initial vision of the story. Dickens did, in fact, write like TV shows because most, a lot of his stuff was serialized and had cliffhangers at the end of, of each story episode. What would be an um, example? What would be an example of one of those? Well, shows? Like uh, the, the old curiosity show, the death of little Nell is actually famous because people in England knew she had died before people in America. And when the boat came into the harbor, the, he agreed to, the captain agreed to fly a flag. I forget what it was. It was like green if Nell was alive, black if Nell was dead. And there were crowds on the wharf waiting for the boat. So he was well aware of how to hang people in there for the next episode, which is what the goal of a, t a good TV show does. That's my initial thought on people wanting to write and how should they write and so forth. The other thing is they always say, write what you know, but boy, there's been some good writers that have written from the interior of the mind. I mean, maybe Kafka knew what it was like to wake up as a cockroach. If he didn't, he was actually pretty good at selling us on thinking that he did. That's probably an overused phrase when you say, write what you know, you know. Well, write what you know suggests that if you took the opposite approach, you would be writing what you don't know. Yeah. Write what you don't know rather than write what you know. How can you know you're a cockroach? You don't know that. And one day you are. So what would your thoughts be on writing what you don't know? Well, again, we can take the lesson from Kafka is that if you read the, you know, the first part of Metamorphosis, the detail of being a roach on his back with his six legs in the air and no mobility of the spine, you know, because it's all encased in chitin and trying to figure out how to get upright 
and move around on the floor shows that it was not all in Kafka's imagination. He actually either put a cockroach on its back and watched it and saw the problems that it had and wrote, wrote it. It's almost biological detail that he borrows for a story that's clearly a fantastic story. There again, coming back to write what you know, you don't have to know it. If, but if you don't know it, you need it for the story. Find out what it is and figure it out and use it. To me, writing what I know implies I don't have to do that much work. I can write about what I know regarding whatever subject it is. If I don't know anything about what it's like to be a cockroach on my back, and I do discover that and can somehow incorporate that into my own sense of humanity and then write it, then that that's where the energy lies. That's the yeah. messy, powerful energy. Coming back to what Kafka knew and what he took from other places, he knew the sense of isolation and despair that the guy who's the cockroach wakes up with. Instead of making it some guy quetching about his situation, he turns him into a cockroach and illustrates it in wonderfully horrifying terms takes it a step beyond just I'm a depressed person I'm living in a funky room with my family who doesn't care about me I, I am nothing so he makes him a cockroach and transforms us into the real horror of the guy but illustrates it in a way that's unforgettable for us since so now we're back to the hellstorm chronicles and the insects on our back so Kafka becomes an insect and and here we are full circle and as we come close to our time together closing our time together you are working on what these days what are you engaged in that keeps your attention I, I did work on a tv show called hello tomorrow that's on apple television it'll be going on in October I didn't write any of the episodes but I was involved in breaking all of the stories and in the uh, editing and rewriting and so forth. It's an interesting idea for a show. It's the future as it would have been if it had started in the 50s. I mean, I guess the closest thing to it is like the Jetsons, only it's live action, it's not animated. And so it's all of the kind of won't it be fabulous when we get in our car and fly to work? And wouldn't it be great when people are living on the moon? And so it has all of that stuff in it, but it has the sensibility of America in the 50s. So it's oriented around salespeople selling condos on the moon. And it's quirky and funny. The guys who created the show, uh, Amit Bala and Lucas Hansen, were young writers that I worked with on a show before and continued to work with, not formally, but you know, they would write something and send it to me and I'd tell them I thought it was great or I didn't think it was so great, whatever. And I would give them thoughts on it and so forth. And they appreciated that. And they actually lobbied Apple to get me on because believe me, nobody today wants to hire an 85 year old man to do anything, but they did. And, and so it was a great experience. It was fun. But I don't really look forward to formally working anymore. I still read stuff. People send me things. I'm happy to do it. I love talking with young writers about their ideas and stuff like that. I, I like hearing new thoughts and new thinking. I want to be amazed. Well, that's a great note to close on. I want to be amazed. Whale and I appreciate your time and I did enjoy your movie. And I know you've done plenty of work throughout your life. and. It's been meaningful for many, many people, and I'm sure a lot of people are grateful to have been entertained and informed by the work you've done, and I'm grateful to have spent this time with you. So, hey, man, thanks a lot. Okay, well, thank you, James. I really enjoyed our time here, and, you know, keep it up. So there you go, my friends. Thus concludes my conversation with Waylon Green. And if you would like to view Hellstorm Chronicle... It's on YouTube. It's free. You can just Hailstorm Chronicle, go Whalen Green, and it'll pop up. It's about an hour and a half long. It's really worth your time. I like what he did, and there's a reason why he won an Academy Award for it.
and it's a very insightful piece. And even though it's dated because it was shot in 1972, so the hairstyles are different, the clothes are a bit different than we have today. That said, the millions and millions of years that we have existed on this planet and the billions of years the planet has existed and infinity, which is how long the universe has been around, uh, 1972, how far back could that be? It's not that far away. So it's dated in the sense of the clothes. It is not dated. It's evergreen in the sense of the relationships that he explores in that film between the insects and the humans. And of course, implied in that are the relationships that exist uh, among all things. How do we interact? What do we do? How are we going to exist? And that's dramatically important right now, I think, because we are starting to experience artificial intelligence in a high-octane way that we've never experienced it before. So not only do we have the environmental variables, human beings doing what they do, we all know what that is, and the insects continuing their destiny as insects, on and on and on, we have this new proposition, artificial intelligence, and there is some worry that it will get out of hand, it will take over the world, it will do all kinds of things that we can't possibly imagine right now, but we can maybe contemplate a bit. So I think it's very important, this documentary film that Whalen made, because it allows us by viewing up close the natural world, it allows us to, to contemplate things we hadn't thought of. I never imagined insects close up having personalities, or at least visually when I look at them, they have personalities. I'm beginning to think they actually do. A few months ago, back when it was winter, and I was sitting at my desk in Taos, doing some work, maybe editing a sound file and recording something as I'm doing now, a little spider walked across the desk and it had bright red eyes and it was, could you call a spider cute? I think so. It was a cute little spider, right? Across the desk and I moved and it stopped, turned and looked at me and I thought it stared for a while, and it may well have. I mean, when you think about it, spiders are brilliant, because if they can make webs like they make, if they can do all the stuff they do, why wouldn't they have sensibilities that might even match or exceed some of ours? So this little spider looks at me with his bright red eyes and stares for a minute, and then he turns his head and continues on across the desk. And that was a moment for me when I started to think, I need to overestimate what these creatures can do. I've always thought, as so many people thought, human beings are the highest intellect. Well, I'm beginning to rethink that, and when you watch Hellstorm Chronicle, you'll see that Whalen was thinking about that in 1972. And in fact, I was having dinner uh, of two or three weeks ago when I was in Manila in the Philippines, was having dinner with some friends and I was having a conversation about artificial intelligence and insects and, and humans and animals and the relationships we all have around the world. And this fellow took the the traditional view. He said, well, you know, of course, the human beings are the, are the highest level species. We're the ones who have most gifts and we're the ones who can, can express ourselves in ways that the other species aren't able to do. Now, the other species don't think like we think. And it was a standard version of human beings I've heard for many years. And I said, well, maybe that's not true. I said, well, how do you even know that's true? And he said, well, I, I know it's true because I know it's true. And I said, well, I suggest maybe we might want to reconsider that because there's so much research out there now about the collaboration among all of the species, all of the elements in on the earth. So he looked at me and he didn't close down around it. It was clear though he had not thought of it like that. I said, think of the, the whales and the dolphins, how they can communicate over great distances through the water. And many 
researchers, scientists, are now beginning to think the dolphins and the, and the whales and the other creatures at that level, and maybe fish as well, have a language. Now, could that be true? I think it possibly is. I even read not long ago that crows are really smart, very, very smart, and they are able to distinguish people's faces. And they might like you, but they might not like me. They might not care for my vibe, or maybe vice versa, they might not care for yours. So they have favorites in human beings, so they recognize folks. And then, of course, there's that classic story of the raven crew in somewhere in Alaska hanging out in a grocery store parking lot. And the ravens have worked out their strategy so much so that they are able to distract you. Two or three ravens will distract you while one of the ravens will take the chicken from your grocery bag. So all of this is at play when I think about the human world. And of course, artificial intelligence has a variable that we really can't quite predict. And I don't really know what's going to happen, although I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. Ezra Klein, who is with the New York Times, does a podcast called The Ezra Klein Show. And he spent a great deal of time interviewing people around artificial intelligence, AI, chat, GPT, GPT-4. GPT stands for Generator Pre-Trained Transformer Model. And if you've tried GPT-3 or 4, chat GPT, you will know that it is kind of remarkable. So now we have a look at, at a little bit of what can go on in the future with all the artificial work. But what about the imaginative intelligence? What about the spider? Red eyes looking at me. What about the crows? What about the ravens? What about you? What about me? Where do we fit in? And how will we make our way in this world? And will we do the things that need to be done to contribute what needs to be there in order for us to have a sense of peace, a sense of belonging, a sense of harmony, a sense of, of, of being in this natural world in ways that add value, not just to the human condition, but add value to the entire proposition. Can we figure that out? Eight billion plus of us roaming around in the vast networks we've created? Well, that remains to be seen. I don't know. Waylon Green hopes so, I hope so, and I suspect you do too. So, on that note, I would like to say thank you for tuning in to Twice Five Miles Radio. As usual, I enjoy doing this show, and I'm always grateful to air it first on WPVMLP Asheville 103.7 and streaming it online, WPVMFM.org. And I like to call it the voice of Asheville, heard all over the world. Really, though, it's the voice of Asheville, and it's heard by you, wherever you are in the world. And hopefully you will listen in more to to the next show. i also like to thank Walter Parks for our theme song, WalterParks.com. If you'd like to know more about Walter's music and Davine Dial for managing WPVMFM, and Robin Collier out in Taos, New Mexico, Cultural Energy Radio for, for airing it on, on Cultural Energy Radio. I do appreciate that as well. And before we go, I would like to close with a poem from my new book just out from 3 A House Press. The book is titled 100 Days, and it's a 100-day story, a 100-day memoir, really, of the healing process I had after I had surgery for prostate cancer. So it's not about cancer, it's about healing up. I wrote the first poem on April 1st, and 62 days later, I wrote this poem, number 62, which is titled Plastic Toy Boat. Across the street from the First Indian Baptist Church, Paseo del Pueblo Sur traffic exhaust floated under the cottonwoods in the Sierra Vista Cemetery. I opened the gate and walked past crosses, notes, fresh flowers, and flags. I thought about being buried among friends. Fire ants scurried around. I noticed a plastic toy boat propped against a small headstone. One oar touched the ground. The other lay across the boat's gunwale, like a spoon on a plate at a kid's birthday party. Boats are made to float on water, I thought. 
I pause for a final moment above the child's grave, under the shading trees at the close of day. So that was poem number 62, Plastic Toy Boat. You may have noticed there were some ants in the poem. Many of the poems I've included in this 100-day series, a memoir, really, a poetic memoir, include insects. There are lots of bees. There's a big bee theme going on. And spiders. A few spiders are crawling around. Got some stars. Got, got a lot of human beings. Got some gardens. And the, um, the scenes change from western North Carolina to Taos to New York City. So it's a, a three-part memoir full of poetry and reflections on how one heals, how one gets over things, how you can pass through the tough spots with less stress if you allow yourself to enjoy the natural abundance of your own creativity. So on that note, I'd like to say thanks ever so much for spending this time. I really do appreciate it. It means a lot to me. And if you would like to reach out, nave at jamesnave.com, you can always email me there. I would love to hear from you. I'll get back right with you. And hey, I hope you are able to join me again for another, another twice five mile show somewhere along the way. And until then, I'll catch you on that turnaround somewhere down the line.